Melonport. Um, we are a company that was founded uh, just over two years ago. Uh, I founded it together with my co-founder, Reto Trinkler. Uh, and we set out with kind of two different visions and two different backgrounds. <laughs> I come from the traditional asset management space, uh, spent eight years as a trader um, at Goldman Sachs, and then four years after that as a fund manager. And then I tried to launch my own fund after that, which was a disaster. And uh, after that, I started to think, why was, it a why was it a disaster? And one of the things that I learned from that experience was how old-fashioned um, and inefficient the traditional financial system is. I think one of the reasons I didn't realize that in my previous two jobs was because they could afford to have three to four operational staff assisting each investment professional, so you never actually ever felt the inefficiencies until you kind of start up as a small to medium uh, startup. So I started researching technologies and then I met my co-founder, Reto Trinkler, and uh, Ethereum was uh, just launching and we thought of uh, trying out a decentralized asset management protocol on the blockchain, and that is Melonport. So today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit um, about the blockchain promise for alternative finance and some of the challenges we're facing. My talk is gonna start off with the promise, what does the blockchain offer for alternative finance and what is alternative finance, why do we need it? Um, I'm then gonna talk about the challenges uh, that are, we are all facing in, in blockchain technology as kind of, uh, you know, people on the kind of bleeding edge of technology and, and, and trying to get user adoption and usability, ease of usability and other challenges we're seeing till we get widespread, uh, widespread user adoption. And last but not least, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the journey to the mainnet. We were, as Anna said, one of the first non-complex protocols to launch on the mainnet in February this year. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how we think about our journey to the mainnet um, and how we plan to phase, phase it in to a, a permanent stable state. So, um, Melon. Um, Melon is the name of our protocol. Um, and Melon, we think, is going to play a very large part in alternative finance on the blockchain. It's essentially uh, a protocol for decentralized asset management. Um, why is that important? So why, why is traditional finance today so inefficient? For those of you who come from a finance background um, or are, are familiar with traditional finance, you may know that it takes three days to settle an equity transaction. Or if we take it a step simpler, you may know that if you want to transfer money to China or some other continent halfway across the world, it does not happen on the same day in most instances, and it costs you a lot of fees. So why is that? It's because the traditional finance sector is, um, is working on technology that's more than 30 years old. And every time new technology comes out, rather than reinvent the, the infrastructure from scratch, they just kind of try to slap it on, on top. So what you end up with is a technology stack which is highly inefficient, slow, uh, lacking in transparency, and uh, you're paying all these fees and you're having very slow transaction times, uh, and you're not really sure where those fees are going. And the key in all of this is in the middle somewhere there, there's just loads and loads and loads of intermediaries who are loving this because they're charging loads of fees in between for doing the processes that no one wants to do, the inefficiencies or delivering the equity certificate to the custodian and so on and so forth. And these guys are taking huge margins in the middle. So what is alternative finance? It's the idea of, uh, it was introduced with the, the Bitcoin blockchain, which I introduced the idea of peer-to-peer uh, -peer accounting, a new accounting system, a blockchain accounting system. And it introduced this idea of peer-to-peer -peer transactions with no intermediaries. And then we had the evolution of that, which was Ethereum um, or other, other blockchains which have computational powers. And these just introduce an entire coding language into the blockchain accounting system, which allow us to compute. Um, and so basically, if you think about Ethereum as a blockchain computer, we are building financial or spe specifically asset management software on the blockchain computer. So we basically aim to disintermediate all those financial intermediary in intermediaries and we came up with the, or we coined the, the phrase TROIFS, and that stands for Technology Regulated and Operated Investment Funds. And uh, just to give an example, 
of what the Mellon Protocol could do and what other financial applications on blockchain can do. Basically, uh, Mellon allows you to set up a fund structure and manage that fund structure and operate that fund structure. In other words, you can predefine rule sets by which you want your fund to run. You can predefine, for example, which exchanges you want your fund to run on. You can uh, pre-identify or pre, uh, predefine the fees, and performance and management fees you want to charge to your clients. You can predefine an asset universe, a rule set for risk management, and you can predefine which investors or which addresses specifically are allowed to invest in your fund. And all of these rules take the form of code, and the code is executed by the, blockchain, uh, by the smart contracts, and the, the, the blockchain essentially enforces those rule sets. So you don't need three to four operational staff anymore per investment professional. You just need a blockchain that works. Um, so we build out all of those rule sets in code, and we make it so that they're easily kind of um, modular, so that the user can just select which ones they want, and we also build a user interface on top of that. And when you have something like that, then it basically becomes very easy to set up any kind of financial product on chain. There are no more any high barriers to entry. There is a huge amount of transparency and you get a, a large amount of reliability with the blockchain as well. So this allows, when you re reduce the barriers to entry, this allows anybody basically to set up a fund and create a track record, whereas today the entry point for surviving hedge funds is typically around $300 million in assets under management. And when you have such a high barrier to entry, what you get is the, the funds surviving or the investment products available to the con consumer tend to be the largest ones, not the best ones. So basically, by lowering the barriers to entry, we hope to uh, give access to a deeper talent pool of people and therefore uh, giving savers and investors uh, access to a much better array of investment projects, pro products which are much more transparent. Um, and lastly, anything to do with fund distribution, if you invest in a fund or redeem in a fund and any kind of accounting metrics, they're all done at the smart contract level, so you don't need to hire accountants. You don't need to hire fund administrators. You don't need to, any of that stuff because it's all done by the code and you have the security of the blockchain accounting system. So just to give a little diagram of how the whole ecosystem uh, fits together. So Mellon is kind of the infrastructure layer in the middle, which allows the regulatory and operational side of things, the rule sets. Um, and um, basically you have the investment manager who comes along and wants to create a Mellon fund. So I want to create an investment fund I choose my rule sets, including which exchanges I'm allowed to trade with, the price feeds, the uh, performance and management fees, et cetera, et cetera, and I deploy this fund to the blockchain. That fund then takes the form of a token, whatever you call that token. So let's call it the Mona Fund token, for example. And now I've permissioned a certain set of investors to be allowed to invest in my fund. And this set of investors can choose to subscribe to my Mellon token fund by sending the cryptocurrency required to that contract. And then the fund contract automatically creates new shares and sends them back to the investor. And in this scenario, the investor has custody of the assets in the fund at all time and has the security of knowing that the manager can never manage the assets in a way that's not pre-permissioned by the code. So for example, he or she can't send the money to a friend or run away to another country or send it to another account because the, the fund contract will only let you spend the funds on the specific assets you're allowed to invest in within the specific risk management profile and charge the fees that you have promised and coded in the smart contract. And on the other side here, we're going to talk a little bit more about the risk management. Um, basically, the risk management rules of the fund usually apply to the trading side of things. Um, and on the other side of um, the kind of financial ecosystem in blockchain, you have another very interesting development called decentralized exchanges or DEXs, which allow for peer-to-peer -peer transactions, again, without intermediaries. And some of those, uh, some of those exchanges are listed here. Um, Radar Relay and ERC DEX are part of 0x relayers. Um, MakerDAO, which was one of the first decentralized exchanges uh, Oasis Dex, sorry, on, uh, built by MakerDAO on the Ethereum blockchain. But there's also now a couple of dozen decentralized exchanges in existence. Um, and basically, these exchanges can now interlink uh, into Mellon. And these are the first three decentralized exchanges that we have integrated into Mellon. And slowly, slowly, you can see the whole ecosystem 
coming together uh, as projects come to market and interacting with one another. So you have Melon here, which is the kind of operation and operational and regulatory layer. You have the decentralized exchanges. And then on the investor's side, you can imagine one day a digital identity uh, provider doing a KYC ML such as Uport or ProCivics or any other of those digital I identity players on the blockchain space. And so here, you basically get an idea of uh, how a fund can run completely automated with very low barriers to entry. This entire setup cost to deploy to the blockchain costs approximately $25 in gas, and that compares with hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and, and several months in the real world to set up a tr traditional style fund. On a good day, this will take two minutes to deploy to the blockchain as long as we don't have any technical issues. <laughs> um, so what are the challenges? Um, I'm going to talk qu quickly about our main challenges, and I think these are probably shared across most blockchain projects. Um, security, ease of usability, price feed, which is probably more specific to the financial applications, and governance. So security, we're very aware that we're building a financial service on the blockchain. It's open source, it's, open, it's free to use, it's permissionless, it's... Uh, um, it's supposed to be reliable because it's dealing with people's assets. The security is of the utmost importance to us. But blockchain technology is also very new and untested. So we try to take as many security precautions as we can. And some of the precautions we take um, are listed here. Oyente is a formal verification tool, which we um, started funding at the middle of last year, I think. And uh, it's basically a tool that allows you to formally verify or mathematically prove uh, that there are no vulnerabilities against a particular attack vector in the code. Um, so we, try, we, we took over funding of Oyente middle of last year, and we basically now um, use Oyente in our everyday coding practice. Um, audits, I mean external code audits. We are now on our seventh code or external code audit. You can't get enough of those, um, and uh, it's very important to us as we are now kind of transitioning to the main net. Um, testing competitions. So in February, as Anna mentioned, we, were, we did the first kind of main net deployment, and what we did was we deployed the first live Melon Fund with the Oasis Dex exchange to the main net, and we funded it with about $100,000 worth of tokens, and we said, for anyone who can hack into that fund, you can keep the tokens. Luckily, nobody hacked it, but that was kind of an example of something we would do to try and test the robustness of the security. Next week, we'll do something similar, but we'll increase the prize pool. Um, so we've got all sorts of ongoing bug bounty programs, and, um, and we hope that as, you know, as the incentives get larger and larger, and as we get closer to going to the main net, more and more people will be incentivized to test it out and report any issues. Um, the second kind of challenge we see is usability. There are two areas for that. One is user friendliness. Um, blockchains are still quite user unfriendly. Um, for an ex as, as an example, if you wanted to download Melon now um, and uh, create a Melon fund on the mainnet, it would take you two to three days to sync your nodes, basically, to be able to create a fund in the most secure way. And that's basically what we want people to be doing. Um, so this is a bit of a barrier when it comes to somebody who wants to test the protocol but doesn't want to wait three days to download the entire chain. Um, scalability is a problem for some people. Um, even though it's much faster than the traditional world, we're still used to things being very immediate and very fast and very, very uh, user-friendly. And this is not quite the case yet in blockchain, but every day it's slowly improving. And finally, you know, the front A, so the user interface to the smart contracts that are kind of engineering the entire financial process in the background. And this, I think, we're quite good at. Um, and that basically comes in the, in, in the, in the form of just a, a, a website or a, a, which runs on IPFS, which is also decentralized, and basically allows you to interact with the contracts in a very user-friendly way. So our team have developed Melon.js, which allows uh, any JavaScript developers to interact with the code very, very easily. Um, and it also, we're very open to, our, our website is open, open source, or our user portal is open source, and we're open to people white labeling the product to, in, in the hope that we may get an even better user um, friendly version. So another challenge is uh, bringing secure price feeds to the blockchain. 
In order to have a secure financial product, you need reliable price feeds. Otherwise, there's room for manipulations in terms of investing in the fund at the wrong price or redeeming at the wrong price, and this can cause uh, a cost to other users. And last but not least, in terms of challenges, is governance. Um, so governance is a project that most blockchain uh, projects that are thinking about mainnet deployment are concerned about or exploring. There's lots of interesting work being done around that. We basically break it up into three segments, and this is kind of where we're at right now. We're really, uh, since last month, working extremely hard on solving some of the governance issues. Um, but the first one is aligning the interests of uh, token holders and providing the right incentives so that we ensure when we let go of the protocol and we give it back to the public who funded it, that there is a, a, the right incentives in place for developers to continue building it, to continue maintaining it, and to continue making sure it's secure, reliable, etc. So that's one of the things we're thinking about. We're also thinking in that same domain about how to incentivize projects building on Melon, because there's already three or four projects who've announced they're starting to build on Melon, how to kind of align their interests as well so that it's in their benefit as well to continue adding to the ecosystem. Um, Melonomics is a, a, another term we coined, I guess. It's basically thinking about how to use the token in order to incentivize all these players in the system. Um, and we're doing some really interesting work around that, which we'll release hopefully next month. And the last thing is about hierarchies and kind of how how, how to incentivize people to vote and the right people to vote. Because one of the things we've seen a lot in token economics is that there's a lot of apathy, even when it comes to saving yourself. Like for the DAO, the DAO for example, which was uh, hacked last year, um, just needed, I think it was a 14% vote, and people, uh, most people were too apathetic to put that vote in. So we need to think about these things, because ultimately we want to give, uh, we're building a decentralized technology, um, we want to make sure that the people who are most knowledgeable about a particular subject are the people who are, um, you know, inputting that, those decisions, but also we want to make sure that it's done in a fair way. So the last section that I want to talk about is just making the leap to the mainnet. So we're now in the f final phase of our project, which is just layering in the governance. And the way we're doing that is we announced the Melon Olympiad, which is basically a series of mainnet testing competitions where we incentivize users to come and set up a fund and manage a fund using Melon um, in return for receiving discounted tokens. And basically the idea here is that we learn from having a concentration on the network, we see how robust it is as it scales, and we try to really give, uh, get users incentivized to test and provide feedback um, and maybe break a few things on the way and fix them. So that's it from me. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, yeah, I think we have a couple questions actually. Do we want to put those up? Cool. Yeah, so first question is, how does Mellon help with government-enforced capital control, for example, in the case of international transactions to and from China? Well, I mean, Mellon can be used in any way the user chooses to, to use Mellon. It's a permissionless, ownerless, and reliable network. It runs, the front end runs on IPFS, so it's also decentralized. So we cannot control how the user uses it. But if somebody wanted to use Melon to kind of, yeah, I mean, Maybe in an anonymous kind of uh, way, they could. Um, does this, does Melon only work with decentralized exchanges? Yeah, for the moment it does, and the reason for that is just pure security. Um, the minute that we go off-chain off and uh, enter a centralized exchange, then we start to have a risk of, um, if the exchange gets hacked, then so does the fund assets. We may at some point consider integrating with centralized exchanges as well, but for the moment the promise is that it's an entirely decentralized fund management protocol.